You are currently in the Mentoring Matters discussion room of the Mentoring Club. And the Mentoring Club is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide a mentoring community for aspiring and seasoned leaders. Anywhere in the world, we help working people find mentors who can guide them to develop the skills they need to achieve their career and life goals. We help mentees fulfill their goals through meaningful work that creates positive impact in the world. So meaningful work is important because when we care about the results, then the leaders in us come out. And as mentees become successful leaders themselves, our dream is for them to become mentors to others. So again, welcome and thank you for joining us in this room. For a few Tuesdays and Thursdays now, we have created this Career and Life Journeys of Mentors interview series to give the platform to our mentors to share their stories so that people can understand and maybe resonate with stories of people who are giving back as mentors and hopefully inspire people who are in that stage of giving back to also join our community as well as encourage mentees to reach out to us or to any of our mentors if they need help. So for today's session, we have Gabrielle Leva von Vave. Our topic is money or values, an intriguing proposition. Let me welcome Gabrielle first. Hi, Gabrielle. Thanks for being here. Hi, good morning, everybody. Happy to be here. Let me just give a full disclosure. Gabrielle and I worked together in Unisys Philippines he was the general manager when I was the program manager for our imaging and workflow solution. He was one of my strong role models in my career when it comes to selling. So maybe this is the first time you're hearing this from me, Gabriel. <laughs> I observed your interactions with clients and I felt that you really cared about their problems. When Unisys didn't have all the components that the client needed, you actually challenge our team to look for and work with partners so that we can deliver an integrated solution that meets the client's needs. So I'm, I know that is your responsibility as the general manager, but at the same time, the approach that you took as far as intently listening, and I felt you were being seriously involved in understanding how we can help. So that actually made a big imprint on my development as a professional as well. So thank you for that. No, well, thank you. Thank you for the nice words. Going back to our topic, money or values, quite an intriguing proposition, as I mentioned earlier. Does it have to be one or the other? Can we have both? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, you can always combine both of them because you can be loyal to your values, you can respect your values, and at the same time, you can make money. Often money is a representation of the value that you bring to the society. Now, of course, there's people that uh, make money the wrong way. That's not the rule. I think that's the exception. Did you realize right away early on that this is something that you cared about? It doesn't have to be just money, but you have to be doing it, living your values at the same time. How did you come to realize that that's the way to go? I was lucky that I was raised by a family where actually values were more important than money. The appetite for money actually came from my own <laughs> growth later, but uh, my father was a physician. He wasn't poor. His main driver was not the money. He would often help people even if they were not able to pay. And my mom was a very generous lady. She was always teaching us to do the right things, to, to respect people, to care about people. So I think values were ingrained since my childhood. I went to a Catholic school. Also, the teachers there were very good in the sense that I did not only receive good education, but also a reinforcement of the values. And I want to say that it's not just because it was a religious or a Catholic school. I think you can get great values also in a non-Catholic school. As I grew up, I realized that there are some key values that will make you successful. And one of them is trust. And I want to emphasize a bit on, on, on that one because when I was a kid, I was a nerd. Okay, So I wasn't like a popular kid. 
but I was very trustworthy. And so as we were finishing school and we're getting to the final years, I was selected the president of the class. But it wasn't because I was popular or good looking or anything like that. It was because people trusted me. They knew that I would take care of the money. I would take care of their interest and I will uh, look after everybody. Uh, trust has been a very key value in, in my life. I actually was born in Peru. So I grew up in Peru. Then I went to university in Germany. My father used to say that I went to university because I just wanted to travel. That was partially true, but it was also because I believed that the education there was good. And I went through university, spent oh, oh, seven years. I got actually my PhD in Germany. Went back to Peru. I, I wanted to help the country. After a few years, the situation was really, really bad. And so I immigrated and, and came to Canada. And I've been a Canadian citizen since the late 80s. That's uh, some of the key stages of my life. Uh, you mentioned, Lisel, that you know we worked together in the Philippines. So when I was working in Canada, I got a couple of international assignments. I was sent to the Philippines. I was sent to Mexico. I also was actually sent back to Peru as an expat. And then eventually I, I got back to, to Canada. In that transition from being in a world where you were protected to gaining your independence in Germany as a student, how many years were you there and what field did you take up in Germany? I was in Germany seven years. I studied naval architecture, got a master's in naval architecture and a PhD in fluid mechanics. Very much in line with IT, as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's probably another interesting twist. How did you get into IT? The independence that you gained in Germany, how did that shape your future decisions about the work that you do and the people that you work with? I was the single boy. Uh, I had two sisters. So I was pretty spoiled as a kid. And I didn't know how to do anything. Before I went to Germany, I wouldn't do my bed, and I'm ashamed of that, but that's the truth, okay? And then when I decided to go to Germany, I was that was one of my concerns. I have to do everything myself. But I think that was one of the best decisions I ever made, because if I would have stayed at home, I probably would end up being too spoiled and too comfortable. So in Germany, I had to learn to do everything myself, not only you know, from as a student, but also as a person. That was really, really great for me. It made me completely independent, able to, to look after me. We didn't have a lot of money, so I had a scholarship, but I would save from my scholarship so I could go back home and visit my family and travel and all do that stuff. So, and, and it's interesting because at that time, I didn't care too much about money. It was always there. I had a very good scholarship. So I actually would finish the month and think about also how I spend the, the remaining money I have for the month. Never thought about savings or anything like that. Later on, when I went back to Peru, and at that time, the situation with the shipbuilding industry was not good at all. I was going to join the remaining shipyard. And after a few days, I started going there. I met the CEO of a medium-sized bank. And he, in a couple of hours <laughs> meeting, he convinced me that I should forget about shipbuilding and move into IT. So that was another critical moment in my life. I realized at that moment that you also want to make money because that's a way that people recognize that you're good. And so I switched mm -hmm. from a shipbuilding into IT right at the beginning of my career. That is interesting because some of the mentees that are um, joining the mentoring club, uh, they are at that stage where they studied for a certain degree, they landed the job, but then they realized, oh, they hate it. And so there is hope in transitioning out of a specific field early on in your career. It's not something that we would call a waste. It's part of the realization of who we are and what we want to do or what we find a fulfillment in doing. That's a great story. In one of our conversations, you mentioned something about looking at the people that you're, you could potentially be working with and putting that as part of the criteria in your decision whether you would join a company or not. Can you tell us more about how you evaluate opportunities that come your way? When you're looking to have a career, you have to like what you're going to do. 
you might have a study something else, but then you realize that you don't enjoy it or there's no great opportunities. You absolutely can make the changes because, you know, university gives you a lot of methodologies, how you think, how you do things, more the methodologies and the processes, and then you can switch careers. And when you switch careers, of course, you want to do something that you like. And part of what you like is who you work with, okay? And so when you are looking for a place of work, uh, you should always meet with people that work in that company and get a good feeling of what the culture of the company is, who are the key players, make a decision not just based on the type of work, but also the culture of the company and the people that you will work with. So in, in my case, the guy that gave me the recommendation to switch jobs, he also offered me a job. So, of course, it was an easy decision because I like him and he was the, the CEO. I wasn't reporting directly to him, but I knew I can count on him. After that, I actually got fired. So that's another interesting story of my oh. life. The bank I joined was nationalized. As I said, the times in Peru were tough at, at that moment. The bank was too, too taken over by the government. They, they fired the CEO. They fired a lot of people. And they fired me also because I had been less than one year with the bank. And at that time, the mm -hmm. policy for government companies was that if you were more than a year, it was very hard to, to let you go. So everybody was, was less than a year was easy target. So I got fired. Of course, it was a shock at the beginning, but very quickly... In fact, the next day, I started in a different company, and it was with people that I had been working with. They were actually one of the suppliers of the bank, and they offered me a job. And the person that offered me a job was the person I had been working with as a supplier, and I liked him. And it was a, a relatively easy decision to join the, the company at that time. Now, years later, when I switched companies, it's been a bit harder because I was very happy with the people that I was working with. I did it because it was a good career growth. There was money there, of course. But also the people that I was going to work with, I felt that they were good. If you're joining a small company, it's even more critical because the culture of the, the few people that work there are going to shape your work dramatically. When it's a bigger company, then it's probably more important the culture of the company. But of course, you also want to talk with people that are going to be your immediate boss and hopefully your peers as well. Talking about big companies, you have been with Unisys, IBM, CGI, EDS. Those are pretty big names and pretty big companies. How did you decide to join these companies in terms of, you mentioned, find out about their culture, but they are huge. So how do you go about doing that? In the case of Unisys, I got fired. I got an offer. I took it. I was very young in my career, so at that time... It wasn't a very strategic decision. I did well with Unisys. I mean, I went to many countries. I, I was general manager in Peru, then in the Philippines, then I had a couple of few countries like Thailand and in the region. Then I moved to Mexico. Then I had the Mexico and Caribbean region. And then I went back to Canada. I found myself that I, I have grown so much that Canada was not a good option for me within Unisys. Because, in fact, what the responsibility they had in Mexico was bigger than all of Canada. They sort of created me a job when I came back, and it, it wasn't attractive to me. So I started looking, and I was very disciplined about where I wanted to work. I actually made a list of the companies I would like to work for, and it was a very short list. It was five companies. It was based on a number of criteria, including knowing people that work in those companies. Then all of a sudden, I got an offer from a different company. And, and let me step back because there's another point here. And it's the value of networking. When I was with Unisys, I focused on doing the job and keeping my clients happy and making sure the employees are, are happy. But I didn't bother too much spending time networking outside the company. When I came back to Canada, on one hand, you know, I've been away for 11 years. That was always more internal focus from a networking point of view. So I didn't know many people. So when I decided I, I'm going to leave Unisys, I had to first work on establishing and creating or recreating my network. So I spent a lot of time networking and meeting people. I wasn't even applying to many jobs. I was just networking to see how things were. And in one lunch, a gentleman from EDS, he offered me a job. I had told him that I was thinking to leave uh, Unisys. And he offered me a job, but EDS was not part of my list of five companies. But it was very attractive financially. 
I wanted to leave Unisys, so I, I said, okay, I'll take that job. It was initially a contract because they didn't have a position for me, but he liked me and he offered me a contract and I took it. A few months later, I did get an offer from one of the few companies that was in my list that was CGI. And so I left EDS and joined CGI. And also in CGI, it was interesting because I had been writing to people and eventually I got a letter from the CEO and the founder. And he said, I've received letters from three different people that I respect, and they all tell me that you're a great person, so we want to meet you. Again, there was no position posted. They met with me, they liked what they saw, and they offered me a job. Key element here was networking. After that, I was very happy, and I wasn't planning to leave CGI. That was one of my, I guess, dream companies. And a headhunter actually came and reached out to me five years later and offered me a job at IBM. It was better money. It was significantly more money. It was a good position. What I did at that time, because I was very happy with CGI, I actually met not only with the hiring manager in HR, but I met with five different people that would be my peers. And that was for me a critical element in making the decision because the peers are the ones that are going to make your life happy or miserable. Your boss is going to help you, at least at the beginning, he's going to give you all the support because he's hiring you. He's making the decision for you, okay? And the people that report to you of course, they're going to treat you nice because you're the boss. The ones that you really have a challenge with are the peers. They don't have no vested interest on in you. I met with five partners because I was joining as a partner, and not an equity partner, but IBM Consulting World, they're called partners. So I met with five of my to-be peers, and that was a critical decision or element in my decision to join IBM. So all those were slightly different. Checking the people was key. And that brings me to Safi. To give you an idea, I mean, IBM had at that time 400,000 employees and Safi at that time was 200 employees. So 2,000 times mm. less, yeah? That was probably the most difficult decision in my career because of the risk. A small company has many inherent risks. Also because the impact that few people can have in your life. In a large corporation, if you're capable, even if your boss doesn't like you have a chance that you'll find another job within the same company. But in a small company, if your boss, who happens to be the owner, doesn't like you, I mean, <laughs> definitely <laughs> that's not going to work. Now, I was lucky because the CEO and owner, I had met him when I was at CGI. He became a, a partner of CGI. When I moved to IBM, one of the first things he told me is, you know, why didn't you tell me that you were going to leave, I could have offered you a job. And I said, look, I wasn't planning to leave. I just got something that was too good to say no. And so we became eventually more and more friends. When I was with IBM, he tried to, to try to hire me. And I, I told him, look, you know, I don't think you can afford me. So I gave him all the details of how much I was making. And he, he smiled. And a few years later, he came back and I said, I can afford you. And so that's how I came to Zafin. What I'm getting as a theme there is that, yes, money is very important. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how you use the money <laughs> with the family and everything. <laughs> <laughs> money is definitely important. That's one of the factors that you look at when you decide to uh, take on work. But at the same time, the people that you work with and the values that the people have and how well you think you could work with them is also a major factor in your decisions. Would that be a fair statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and like I said, you know, I would have never joined a small company if I didn't know the CEO that well and if I didn't like him. I mean, he is a very honest person. He's a very trustworthy person. A very committed person. He cares about his employees. He cares about the clients. I mean, he shares many of the values that I share. And that's why also we became friends. I mean, we, we travel together. We know families. Even during COVID, I actually, the only trip I did last year was to British Columbia and we spent some time together. He lives in Vancouver. So that's a very good statement. Combining both, getting good money and making sure that the company you work for has the, the values that you respect. When did you realize that those two things will have to go together? Otherwise, it's not the work for you or it's not the environment for you. 
it wasn't like a one day realization. It, it was more like an evolution. When I was young and probably many young people have gone through that, money is not the most important thing. Many young people in my generation were actually left-oriented. You know, they want to change the world and social equality. All those things were very popular when I was growing up. And I wasn't very driven by money. As I mentioned before, when I was at university, I used to make sure I spent all my money. Actually, pretty generous. I would invite a lot of people. I didn't care about money. And when I went back to Peru again, if I wanted money, I would have stayed in Europe. So going back to Peru was definitely not driven by money, it was driven by values. I felt I got scholarship from the country, my family's there, I should go back, so I did it. But, but then I started to notice that there's a lot of things in life that you can do for which you need money. And traveling is one of them, giving things to your family, having a comfortable life. I mean, you, you need money for that. And, and then I also realized that if people really value your work, they ought to pay you more. And, pay you competitive. I was very vocal when I was asking for a raise. It's, it's even interesting. I had once advice from a former boss. He said, if you think that you're not making enough money, go and find another job. And so that's what I did. I went and found another job. And then I came back to him and said, look, I have an offer. It's more than what you're paying. He said, okay, I'll increase your salary. So, you know, so um, it, <laughs> Because sometimes we believe that, you know, we're worth more. So you need sometimes some reality check. But it is true. I mean, you ought to be paid according to the value that you bring. What about your decisions uh, between Canada and Peru? What was the driver for that? Was that career driven or was it something else? So my decision to move from Peru to Canada was lifestyle more than career. The situation in Peru was bad. I mean, I'm talking inflation of about 100% per month. Uh, that was the 80s in Peru. I mean, we had car bombs every week. You know, there were explosions, you know. Some people would not even put back the glass in their windows because they knew next month there'll be another explosion, they'll lose the windows again. It was really pretty bad. It was for me, for my wife, uh, my daughter. But it was more like standard of life than career or anything else. I actually, I didn't have a job. I mean, it, it looks like I was transferred, but I wasn't. Uh, I quit Peru. I quit Unisys in Peru. And I came to Canada. And within two weeks, I was rehired. So it, it was pretty easy, but I wasn't transferred. It was, uh, and it was a personal decision, not a career decision. Now you are in a small company and when you joined, it was 200 people. How many people do you have now? And how are you finding your work in a small company? Have you thought of even getting into entrepreneurship yourself? Many questions. So let's start with the last one. Okay. I think I'm a bit of a coward. Okay. So I am afraid of losing too much and it's very comfortable to have a salary. I know that I can always get a good salary. So. I've never really thought seriously about putting my own company, even that I'm sure I could make more money and maybe even be happier. I don't have the balls to do it. Now, being in a small company like this, because of my relationship and my position and my package and all that is probably the nearest I can get to being a self-entrepreneur. And part of the decision of joining the company is not just salary and how nice the job is, it's also the upside that the company can have if, if it goes public, which eventually will yeah, do. Okay. Right, yeah. So you ask also about the size and how different it is. <laughs> I make this analogy because I studied shipbuilding. When you are mm -hmm. at IBM, it's like being on a transatlantic. Okay. You turn the rudder and you wait an hour to, to see the effect of the ship moving. When you are in a small company like Safin, it's like speed, mm -hmm. you know? You have to be careful. You don't turn the wheel too much because you'll hit the wall. It's very, very different. It's way more dynamic and you have to make adjustments all the time. You can't just uh, sail along. A few years after I joined, I think two and a half years or so, we actually sign a partnership with Accenture. And as part of that partnership, we transfer most of our professional services team to Accenture. And so I was actually at that time responsible for services and we sold in quotes our services business to, to Accenture as part of our partnership. So the number of employees went down to 150. At that time, I moved to sales and now we're back to about 340. So it, it's gone down and now it's gone up again. You're committed to see this company go public, it seems like. 
that would be a good uh, a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, another disclosure on my part. When I was start to figure out what I would do for give back, and I spoke to you, and also Mark, who also was one of our colleagues in Unisys and in Asia Pacific, the two of you were my first supporters for creating the mentoring club, and that gave me a lot of courage because the two of you are both my role models. I know that you're also doing some give back in Canada. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? When I came back to Canada, as part of my effort to, to network, I met with a lot of people from different areas. And, and I realized that Latinos in particular, but Hispanics in general, they didn't have the best branding in the country. When you think about good people in IT, most of people will think people from India, okay? And when you think hardworking people, most of the people will think Chinese or a good business, Chinese. Great people for service, people will think of Filipinos. Latinos, though, they think party people, you know? <laughs> like, so we, we came together with a few guys that they were not previously known to me. Actually, I met them through networking. And they had this idea of creating an organization to help the Hispanic people in technology. In fact, at that time, they were not sure. They wanted to help Hispanic people and something to do with technology. So jointly, we, we shape it and create an organization called Hispanotech. Hispanotech has been around now for 12 years. It's been a very successful PIN in Canada. I call it PIN Professional Industry Network. I was the president when, when it was created, and I was supposed to be the president for three years. Nine years later, I finally stopped being the president. They wouldn't let mm -hmm. me go. But it, it was a great experience. And the organization's main focus are networking, mentoring, technical updates. You can call it education, but it's a short type of courses. But networking and mentoring are very key to the organization. Well, I was part of Spanotech. I became a board member of the Toronto Region Immigration Employment Council, which is a, probably the most important organization to help immigrants to get jobs. But these are professional immigrants, not, not every type of immigrant. And within TRIEC, they sponsor groups. And so there will be the Filipino Lawyer Association or Romanian In Engineer Association, etc. And Hispanotech is one of those pins. But it was the first pin that was recognized with the award of excellence by TRIEC because we really did a lot of good things. And we went beyond just having the organization. We actually spearheaded activities with other pins. For example, our mentorship program started just within us. Now it groups 10 different organizations. We're still the organizers and the leaders but it has another nine organizations. And we've had as much as 300 mentees in one year. We have one session per year. We tried two, but it was a bit too much. So now it's only one session. I think this year is only like a couple of hundred people, 200 people maybe, but it's very successful and doing very well. So that's the story of uh, my giving back in Canada. What would you advise people who are getting into the workforce as far as navigating their careers as are concerned. You should really look after what's your passion, okay? Because if, if you are passionate, if you're motivated, chances are you'll do much better than if you're just doing the job for the job. Quite often, of course, that is what you studied, but in some cases it might not be. It could be you, you make the wrong decision or the environment change or whatever. So don't be afraid of changing if that's what is going to make you happy. The other thing is, of course, you have to work very hard. If you join a company, you want to create a reputation of yourself. You have to work hard. I've noticed that new generations are more into work-life balance, and, and that's good. But I think at the beginning of the career, it has to be a bit more on the work than on the life because you want to make a name of yourself. But at the same time, you shouldn't just work hard. You also should work smart. You should network. You should meet the right people not just sitting in your desk and working all day. That's not good. People need to know. And you should create a brand for yourself. Very early in your career, you need to tell people what you're good for. What is your branding? That way people will seek you as opposed to just give you work. Is there anything that you did that you would advise your younger self not to do? Plan a little bit more, okay? Like I said, at the beginning, some of the things that happened in my life were not planned. I was lucky that it happened. I could have planned a little bit more, 
The other thing is, of course, network. I started pretty late, to be honest with you. Those two things I would do different. Uh, you have shared your journey so far. And if you were to write a book about your life's journey, what would the title of the book be? It would be something with trust, maybe the importance of trust or the value of trust, but something like that, because I really believe that has been critical in my success. And I think it's critical in everybody's success. I'm in, in a fintech, so we always talk banks are in the business of trust, which is true. But I think all the people should make trust one of their key aspects of their life. I fully agree. So that is also one of the things that we set up as a core value within the Mentoring Club when we were defining what should be our leadership core values. Trust is actually broken down into integrity, honesty, and commitment because those are values that eventually make us trustworthy as individuals and professionals. So we're pretty much aligned with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabrielle, for sharing your story. Oh, just to, to thank everybody for attending. Thank you, all the people that had uh, comments and additional suggestions. Really appreciate that. And we're finished in uh, 2021. So hope also you all had a great start for next year. All right. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the journey, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Join us again in our future sessions. Take care.